Oh, hi, this is Mike. Um, I'm ready to record. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Last time we introduced tags and, and saw how they are used in creating web pages. Um, to sort of summarize and review, and I, I plan on sort of duplicating what we did last time um, for a couple reasons to, to point out some of the things in the process and just make, su make sure that you, you understand it. Um, but the notion that we came up last time is that web pages contain, uh, are, are written in HTML. HTML standing for Hypertext Markup Language. The phrase hypertext means that it's more than text somehow. It's not just a bunch of letters. It, um, there, there's additional meaning to it. For example, some of the words on our page are going to be links to other pages. Some of the words are going to be headings and so on. And therefore, it's beyond regular text. And the way that we indicate the meaning of the words on our web page, whether it's a heading or it's text, is through the use of tags. So, HTML, hypertext, markup language, and Markup or tags would do something like this. We saw an example. In that case, we've marked up the text, we've tagged the text to indicate that the phrase my web page isn't just ordinary text. It is a headline or a header, rather. It's sort of a top-level header. And that's what the H1 means in, uh, in the tag. Tags come in pairs. All right? For every starting tag, there is also an ending tag. Hopefully that's a little bit more readable for you. But tags come in pairs. For every starting tag, there's an ending tag, so they match up. And they go around the thing that they're tagging. So what this is saying is starting here is the heading, and here's where the heading ends. Because here's our start tag, here's our end tag. This is the name of the tag. An ending tag repeats the name and then has a slash at the beginning to indicate it's an it's a ending tag, not another starting tag. Uh, we talked about actually seven tags last time, all right, although it might not seem like it. We talked about H1s through H6, uh, and those are the headings, all right, and you can go six levels deep in headings, which should be enough for any web page, all right. Keep in mind I'm not talking about six headings, I'm talking about six levels of headings. So you could have a couple of top level ideas. So you could have two H1 tags on your page. You could have, underneath each of them, you could have maybe three subtopics. So there'd be three H2s under each. And then maybe underneath the subtopic, there's sort of a sub-subtopic, in which case there'd be an H3. So it indicates a structure or a hierarchy. It, it doesn't, uh, I, I've seen some students make their first heading an H1, their second heading an H2, their third an H3, and, that, and don't think of it in that terms. Think of it in terms of the level that the topic is on the page. And the heading reflects that. The browser displays the headings in larger text. So uh, the thought being that something that's more important is going to be bigger. So a top level heading gets a bigger font, second level heading gets the next bigger font, and so on down the line. The other tag that we talked about was a plain old paragraph tag, which we put on our page simply to put a paragraph of text. All right. 
So that's kind of what we did last time in Fast Forward. What I want to do now is I want to create a web page from scratch. Uh, last time, just to, to get everything in, um, there's a few details I sort of glossed over. And we'll come back in and address some of those details today and expand upon where we left off last time. First of all, uh, in this class, I am, uh, or we're going to use simply a plain old text editor for creating our pages. There are a lot of tools available that help people to create web pages, such as Dreamweaver and, and Visual Studio um, and so on. While those tools are good and they have their place, I think for people learning it, uh, it's, it's, it's possible that those tools can become a crutch and can teach some bad habits. Therefore, it would be like giving a, a student that was just learning uh, basic math a calculator, right? You don't want to give someone a calculator if they don't really know math very well. Otherwise, they'll misuse it. They'll multiply instead of dividing or whatever, all right? So we're going to use just a plain old text editor that will really let us see the code on a nuts and bolts level. So what we're going to do to create our web page is we are going to create it in Notepad. So I open up Notepad. All right. And I'm going to put just a couple of H1s and H2s and paragraphs on the page just to kind of get us back to where we left off last time. So I'll put in an H1. Well, it can be upper or lowercase. We're going to stick to lowercase in this class uh, because it will transition better to uh, XHTML, which we'll talk about later on in the term. Say, I'll make a web page to describe my Wednesday schedule. And I'll put a couple paragraphs in here. Review basic tags, learn more tags. And I could go on and on and on, but you're not terribly interesting to see me type. Second level, uh, another second level heading would be um, afternoon. And I'll put a paragraph that will say, you know, first. Go home, eat lunch, stop at the library. I'm going to put another paragraph that will say, pick up daughter at school. I have a question mark, okay. It's not because I'm not sure whether I can pick up my daughter or not. It, <laughs> it's because I am easily the world's worst typist. Um, I, I've been doing this for, for, you know, who knows how many years, and I still, I don't, I'm better than like a two-finger typer, but I'm probably a four-finger typer or maybe a five-finger typer on a good day. This is useful for me to use this example because, again, at the beginning of the semester, you know, I have a hard time remembering my schedule and what I'm all supposed to do. So this will be good reinforcement for me. Oh, 
All right. I've created this page and notice again that for every tag there is a starting and ending tag. And the starting and ending tag sort of wraps around the text that I want to mark up. So that's my top level heading for this page. Therefore the H1 starts and ends and goes around it. This is a second level heading. All right, H2 start and end. Here's my paragraph which again I could go in more detail but just in the interest of time I have a short paragraph there and then I repeat the process. All right. I'm now going to save it. And this is one of the things that I kind of glossed over last time. So a couple people indicated an email that they had trouble with uh, a couple things. So, so watch carefully. First of all, when we go to save it, we're going to go and click save. One thing you have to do is change that from, say, if you're using Notepad anyhow, you have to change that from saying save as type text document and change it to say all files. All right. The normal format um, to save files from Notepad is uh, .txt. All right. We don't want our files to end in .txt. What files end in is called the file extension. All right. And we don't always see the file extension, which can sometimes be confusing. So one of the things that we're going to do after we save this is we're going to turn on so that we can see the file extensions, so that we can um, not have some of the confusion that we might otherwise have. So the first thing I'm going to do to save it as a .html file, I am going to go and change from save as type to all files. I then can go in and type in my name. and end the name with a .html. All right. That will save it as a .html file. All right. When I do that, all right, here's the file. Notice that the icon is, in my case, a little Firefox symbol, indicating that the default file, or I'm sorry, the default program for this file type is Firefox. That's how this particular computer is set up. Depending on how your computer is set up, it might say Firefox, it might say Google Chrome, or show the icon for Google Chrome, it might show for Internet Explorer. All right. We want to make sure that the file extensions are turned on. And they are on this particular machine because if you notice it shows Wednesday.html. Might be a little hard to see, but you can sort of take my word for it. Wednesday.html. Not all computers are set up that way. Many computers, and again, depending on the operating system, on, on Windows 7 it's a little bit different, but if you go to folder options, file type, um, I'm sorry, view, there's a little checkbox that says hide file extensions for known file types. And I think by default that's how, the fi uh, that's how the computers are set up in lab. It says hide file extensions for known file types. So if you notice it does not show the .html now if they're hidden. So if you go and do this in lab or maybe on your computer at home, you might not see the .html. You want to be able to see the .html. So what I would suggest doing again is going into the folder options and under view unchecking that box that says hide extensions. Just be aware of this uh, when you get to lab if anyone has trouble finding this option I'll be glad to show them in lab. Keep in mind also that this really depends on the particular uh, operating system you're on. In, in Windows XP it's this way. Uh, in Windows uh, 7, it, you know, the menus are slightly different to, to get there. But now I can see when I look at this file that the full file name is Wednesday.html. It's important that you turn those file extensions off because we need to know, for all our files, we need to know the complete file name and we need to be sure about it. So whatever image we know, we need to know does it end in a .jpg or a .jpeg. All right. Those last few characters, the characters after the period, 
again, are what are called the extension, and they help Windows know what type the file is. And again, oftentimes, just to keep things simpler, they're turned off, but we want to make sure the file extensions are turned on. All right? Other important thing to remember is um, that we only have one web page here. I, I hear some students sometimes talk about, well, there's the notepad file and then there's the uh, Internet Explorer file or the browser file. There's only one web page. We're simply looking at it two different ways. It, it would be like if you had a photograph of my head, all right, and then a CAT scan of my head. Only one head, right? But it looks differently, all right, depending on how you are viewing it. Same thing with our web pages. We only have the one web page file, the .html file. But when we're opening it and viewing it in Notepad, that's sort of like the CAT scan. We're seeing the, the inside of it. We're seeing the guts of it, all right, so that we can go in and, and change the code and, and fix it and make it work the way we want to. Um, when we view it in a browser, that's sort of the outside, how the rest of the world is going to be seeing that web page. So to view the web page, we simply double click on it, and if we've named it correctly, it will open up in our browser of choice. And there we have it. Notice again. H1 is the biggest font because I've said that that is my top level heading and therefore it's considered to be the most important so it's the biggest. The H2s are smaller because they're sort of like the second level. And finally the paragraphs are, are just sort of a normal font size. Question, yes? Um, like for our lab, if mm -hmm. we know more tags, like I've been programming websites for like four years, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can always do more than is asked for in, in class. So uh, we're going to talk about a few more tags here today, all right? But if you know stuff beyond that, yeah, you're welcome to do that. Um, the only thing I caution is that um, we're going to teach a particular way of creating websites. So if you do something that sort of contradicts the way that we're going to develop websites using CSS or whatever, um, I, I will point it out, but I won't deduct points if we haven't covered it yet. For example, if you're familiar with developing web pages, if you were to use a font tag, we're never going to use font tags in this class. So if you use it on this assignment, it's not like I'm going to take off for it because I haven't talked about the alternative to doing it that way, but we're not going to continue to do it that way in the future. All right. Now, last time in my desire to, to get through a, a basic example, I sort of left out a, a handful of tags that are going to be on every page that you develop. And these tags are sort of like general housekeeping sort of tags. And I'm going to go back in now and add those in. All right? Because this really isn't a completed web page because it's missing a few things. The first tag that I skipped is the HTML tag. The HTML tag is simply used to identify to the browser, hey, this is an HTML document. Later on in the class, we'll, we'll supply some more information about what version of HTML we're using and so on and so forth. But for now, we can simply make it an HTML tag. Now, I said each starting tag has an ending tag. All right. The ending HTML tag goes. That would be the first tag on your page, would be an HTML tag. Right. And the last tag is going to be the end HTML tag. All right. This is what's known as nesting tags. All right. If you think of those old little Russian dolls where one nests inside the other. You know, nest means contain, all right? Another way of looking at this page is everything on this page is part of my HTML document. Therefore, everything is between the start and end HTML tag. So that HTML tag wraps around the entire page because the entire page is my HTML document. 
So I have my start HTML tag at the top of the page, my end HTML tag at the bottom of the page. Rules about nesting tags. All right. Nesting tags, um, the principle of nesting is something like this. If a tag starts within a tag, it should also end within it. What do I mean? Well, this would be incorrect. All right. Why is that incorrect? Because this paragraph tag is within the HTML tag, yet the ending tag is after the HTML tag. So it doesn't nest completely inside it. It sort of overlaps it. There's no overlapping tags. Tags are either independent of each other or nested inside of each other. You're never going to have tags that overlap where one start, you know, where tag A starts, tag B starts, tag A ends, and then tag B ends. It'll be either tag A starts, tag B starts, tag B ends, tag A ends, or tag A starts, tag A ends, tag B starts, tag B ends. So basically you said if a tag starts within a tag, it must end within the tag. Yep. And that's known as nesting. Um, you know, think of, you know, think of these tags as containing other tags. Like, for example, in a minute here we're going to look about, we're going to look at um, uh, links. All right? And when we create a link, we're going to have our link within this paragraph. All right? In which case, that, that link is part of that paragraph. It's not external to it. Therefore, our link tag is going to be within that paragraph tag. All right. Another tag that is standard on every page is a head tag. I didn't wear it today, but oh, I think Monday um, I wore my little baseball hat that has a head tag on it around my head, being very clever. All right. The head tag indicates information about the page. And we'll see a, a number of things that we're going to put in the head tag. But to start out, we're going to put a title tag. Zeller's 824. By the way, what I normally do when I'm working on a web page is I'll have it open both in that, uh, uh, Notepad and in the browser. And I'll go in, change the file in Notepad, click Save, then go to the browser and refresh. Notice that the title appears up here on the title bar. It's not part of the page itself. It's in, up here in the title bar. Also, if I were to minimize this, it's what shows down here on the taskbar. So how does it know to put it there? Well, that's how we tagged it. We said this is the title of the page, and that's where the title of the page appears, up in the, up in the title bar. By the same token, just as if there's a head section, there's a body section where the main content of the page lives. So if we were going to sketch out sort of the, the template for a web page, it would look like this. We have an HTML tag at the top an nhtml tag at the bottom. We have our head tag at the top. Inside the html tag, then we have the body tag, and then we have some stuff between both of them. So every web page that you create in general is going to look like that. Notice that all these tags are properly nested. There's no overlapping. The head starts and ends within 
the HTML. The body also starts and ends within the HTML tag. And the head and the body are sort of independent. They don't overlap at all. All right. If I were to do this, that would be incorrect because that's not properly nested. The body tag in that case starts inside the head but doesn't end inside the head. All right, what's wrong with that picture? Well, the body tag shouldn't start within the head tag. The body and head are two independent things. So this would be the correct way to do it. Notice that when I wrote it out, I indented. All right. The reason I did that is sort of a golden rule of any sort of software development is that if you make a change, or, or I'm sorry, that anything that you create at some point you're going to have to go back and change. All right? And if you're going to go back and change it, you can make it a little bit easier for yourself if you make your code easy to read. All right? The browser doesn't care what your code is. I really don't even have to put these tags on different lines. I could just have one giant line of text with all my tags. And if I got my tags correct, the browser would display it correctly. All right? But my, a web page consisting of just one giant line of text would be very hard for me to go back and read later on. I wouldn't be able to see what's contained in what and, and so on. Therefore, what you can do is you can indent any way you like. All right? And you might think, well, if I put an indention on it, will that cause things to display differently? No. That's actually a great characteristic of HTML is the way that it treats what is called white space. White space is any space in the, in, in the page, all right, sort of a blank space. And it really treats any blank space as though it's only one space. So. You could type all your, your tags in one line, but the web browser is going to read it to a writing. The, the, the web browser will display it correctly even if you put it all on one line, right. But we're not going to want to do that, right? Instead, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to properly indent this. So let me go and indent this so that the indentation reflects the nesting. All right my HTML. The head is part of the HTML, so I indent it a little bit to show, hey, that's part of the HTML. That's contained within or nested within the HTML tag. The body is also nested within the HTML tag, so I indented it as well. Oh, you can't see it? All right. You have to guess then. No, I'm just kidding. I'll do that. Uh, an average of two times a week. All right. So I have one more this this week because I don't think I, I did it first class. Yes. Oh, I just I just hit the tab. Tab, or you could actually hit the space a bunch of times. This tab is just a little more straightforward. So you would go in front of your H1 and tab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I did to to kind of show you what I did. I went in front of there and just hit the tab key, All right. and that keeps it nice and lined up. But notice that the head and the body are sort of on the same level. They're not nested in each other, so one isn't indented from the other. They're both inside the, the HTML tag, so they're both indented the same amount within there. At a glance, I can get a sense of how this page is nested just by looking at it like this. In other words, if I took my glasses off, you know, I couldn't tell you what those tags say, but I could tell you that this tag is inside of this tag and this tag is inside of that tag. All right? Because, again, I know that from the indenting. Now, keep in mind that's not a requirement. You don't have to do that. But it's a good practice to do that because that makes your code a lot more readable 
And when you start getting more involved web pages where you have a lot of tags inside of other tags, it will really help you keep it straight, how your page is structured. Um, those indentations, by the way, have no impact on the space, the spacing. So I can look at that and looks the same as it did. I can even go in and put a bunch of spaces in the middle here, put the starting and ending tag on, this, on different lines if I wanted to, and it also has no impact. Simply because the white space is pretty much ignored. The blank space is pretty much ignored and it gets sort of converted into a single space. So I could put the start and end tag on different lines, I could put them on the same line. Really doesn't matter. The browser doesn't care. The way you do it is the way that you think will be most readable so that when you come back later and look at it, um, it'll make sense to you. So now this is pretty much a completed web page, right? We have our HTML tags, we have our head and body, we have a title, and we have some content in the body. Any questions at this point? All right. The next tag that you absolutely have to have to do the first assignment is the link tag. All right. The link tag is a little bit different than the tags that we've looked at so far. All right. And I'm going to start out and I'm going to I'm going to put in I'm going to start typing something in I'm going to leave some space to add something. So if you're taking notes on this, leave a little space in your notes to to add something. But let's say Let's say I add the text, I'll teach, I teach at LCCC. What if I wanted to make LCCC a link? All right. Have a link smack dab in the middle of the paragraph. All right. How could I do that? Well, the answer to how to do anything in HTML is with a tag. So we just have to learn what the right tag is to do that. And we'll surround that word, we'll surround LCCC with the link tag and boom, we'll be in business. So a link? Is, what, a link? Yes. what is a link? Yeah. Uh, a link is, is like this. When you go to, let's go to LCC's page. A link is something like this. If I click on it, I go to another page. Okay. All right. All right. So let's say I want to make that a link to go to LCC's page. So when I click on the text LCCC, I want to open up that page. All right, I want to open up lorraineccc.edu. How do I do that? Well, I'll go and I'll add the link tag. What is the link tag? The link tag is the A tag. And here's where I'm going to leave some space. So leave some space in your notes. I'm going to put the A tag before and after the text that I want to be the link. All right. Now, that's part of the things that you need to do. That's part of the way to make that text a link. What seems to be missing from this? Yes. Yeah, a link to what? All right. We can't simply say, I want this to be a link. A link to what page? There's billions of pages on the internet. Which one do we want to link to? So we have to add a little bit of information to this tag. And extra information about a tag is called an attribute. All right? Think of it this way. 
let's say I wanted you to um, put this in my car. You know, I, I, you know, I, I needed to go do something, and I say, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you can you put this in my car for me? All right. If you went out to the parking lot and looked, what would you see? You'd see fifty thousand cars. <laughs> which one do you want me? Which one is yours? Which one do you want to put this in? Well, I'd have to describe my car. I'd have to give you attributes about my car. I might tell you the color of the car, I might tell you the make, the model, uh, the license plate number, uh, what bumper stickers I have on my car. I, I might give any sort of description of my car that made sense, that I thought would help you find it. You know, Those characteristics of the car are additional information. I want you to go to my car, but which car? I need to describe it further. It's the same thing with a link. I, wanna, I want that text, LCCC, to be a link. So that's the A tag. Well, that's not enough by itself. A link to what? What web page do you want to go to? Just like what car do you want me to put this in? So, we have to add a little piece of information to that A tag. And in this case, oops, the attribute that we add is called the href. So, we have our a tag, but notice within the less than and greater than sign, I have more than I have on all the other tags. Notice the paragraph tag, the H2 tag, none of the other tags, all of them just have the less than sign, the name of the tag, than the greater than sign. Here, I have the less than sign, a space, then I have my attribute, name and value. All attributes in HTML look the same. They have the name of the attribute, they have an equal sign, and then enclosed in quotes, they have the value of the attribute. And these are a list of predefined attributes. And when we learn images, for example, we have to say, well, what image do we want to display? When we say links, we have to say, what page do you want to link to? So for each tag, there'll be a set of attributes that we can apply to give additional information. All right? And in this case, that additional information is the URL, URL means address, of the page that we want to link to. Normally what I do is this. I'll pull up the page that I want to link to in the browser and simply copy and paste it. So for example, if you are doing uh, assignment one and you Google one of the topics, and you find a page about them, you would simply go up here and copy it and then paste it into your document as the href attribute. I then have the text that I want the link to be between the start A and end A tag. Notice that the href attribute, <coughs> like all attributes, is only part of the start tag. It's not also part of the end tag. Was there a question or were you stretching? Okay. All right. So let's look at this and, and see how this works. Let's make sure we save it. And we'll go and click refresh here. Notice now that text is a little different. LCC is blue and it's underscored. And if I put my mouse on it, notice the mouse pointer changes to be a little finger. And if I click on it, it takes me to LC's web page.
All right. So you should know everything that you need to know to do the first lab, right? Because we covered the, the missing ingredients from last time. The missing ingredients from uh, last time were the HTML, the head, the body, and the link tag. Now that we have those, you should be able to do, do that lab. Now, if you want to investigate further, um, we should talk about this probably on Monday, but there are list tags that you can use. You know, one way to show your links would be through a list of links. And there's a tag to create a list, a bulleted list of items. And you could, you could use that uh, tag to create a list, a nice little bulleted list of your links. But that's not a requirement for this, this lab. All right. Before we go, all right, this web page that I just created here looks a lot like the pages that were on the web when the web was first created. In fact, if we go to calculus.org, you'll notice that Essentially, this is simply a bunch of header tags, links, and a list. We haven't talked about lists yet, the bulleted list. But essentially, with the seven or eight tags that we talked about, along with a couple more, you can make a page that looks like this with maybe a couple of, of small tweaks. All right. And this is what old school pages look like. I mean, if you surf the web back in 19 whatever, pages look mainly like this. Well, we want to change the appearance of our page. And we want to make our page look different. And we do that for any number of reasons. All right? We may want, for example, the page to reflect the colors that are associated with our organization. You know, LC's stuff is blue. All right, they chose that color theme. If we were doing a website for Barbies, if we were doing a website for our Barbie collection, not that I have a Barbie collection, but if I did and I was doing a website, I would probably do the colors, you know, some variations of pink. All right. If I was doing a website for a heavy metal band that I was in, not that I'm in a heavy metal band, I would probably make the colors black and white. All right. So there's a lot of reasons for changing the appearance of the page. You want your pages to look nice first and, you know, on one level. But in addition, there's other reasons as well and we'll explore those. How do we change the look of our page? We change it not through HTML, but through a different language. And that different language is CSS or cascading style sheets. We're just going to get a taste of what you can do with cascading style sheets today. But our work this semester will be really expanding upon the links that we've created, or I'm sorry, the tags that we've used, learning more tags, learning more attributes, and learning more techniques in CSS. So, Right off the bat, let's say I want a different color for my page. All right. Um, what I can do is this. I can go into my code, and in the head section, I'll put a style tag. All right. Almost. That tells the browser, hey, the following code, all the code between the start and end style tag is not HTML code. We've left HTML land and we're in CSSville. All right? And CSS allows us to change the appearance of the page. The first thing that we're going to change about the appearance of the page is the color 
of the page because that's probably the most obvious thing to change. All right, it's the most immediately apparent and visible. Is there anyone that's colorblind here? All right, I would say I should watch myself because if you're colorblind, then it's not the most easily apparent uh, thing to see. But for people that are not colorblind, this is probably the most obvious thing I can see. Let's say I want to make the whole page yellow with blue text on it. All right, instead of the default, which is the browser's default, which is black text on uh, a white background for this particular machine. All right, what I will do is I'll put body. Put one of these little curly brackets, also known as braces. Background, yellow, because I want the background to be yellow. Color, blue. Here's the way CSS works. The first thing on a line, the thing that's outside of the braces, is called the selector. All right? The selector describes the thing on the page that gets the style roll. In other words, in this case, everything inside the body tag, I want its background to be yellow and the color of the text to be blue. All right. What is within the braces? A set of style rules. Each style rule contains an attribute, something we want to change about the page, and the value. We then have a semicolon and the next attribute colon value. So if we look at this now, we'll see the page is yellow with blue text. All right. Now this isn't a requirement for the first lab, but if you want to play around with this, you're welcome to do so. We'll definitely talk more about this if, if it's not clear what we're doing. One last thing before we leave. That made the entire page yellow with a blue background. Let's say I want the entire page to be yellow with a blue background, except I want the H1, pay, uh, H1 tags on this page to be reversed. I want the H1 tags to be yellow background with blue text. How would I do that? Tell me what to type. All right. First of all, I have to type my selector. I have to say, hey, what on the page do I want to change the appearance of? I want to change the appearance of the H1 tags on the page. What do I want to do with them? Well, I want to do the opposite. I want to make the background blue, and I want to make the color of the text yellow. So what that will do is every H1 on the page, it will do that too. All right? You see, I know my lectures are so enthralling that people are just dying to get in here and they come, come barging in. All right? What if I wanted to do something different with H2s? Maybe H2s I want to have a gray background in blue text. Well, then I can say H2. background, uh, color, I forget what I said, gray, color, blue. It's a change it to H2. Thank you. Does Only if you're in England. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Well, we can try. <laughs> we can try. I, I think it does. All right, there we go with that. Out of curiosity, let's try it. And yes, it does. Because usually that's how I spell it. Uh, so I don't know why I spelled it A-Y today. All right, now notice what it did. It made every H2 that color combination. 
So in our CSS, when we have a selector, everything that matches that selector gets that rule. All right. The simplest thing that we're covering first off is rules to change the color, but almost anything <laughs> almost anything uh, that deals with the appearance, the font size, the font type, the position, how much space is around it, anything that you can consider about the appearance we can handle through CSS. And throughout the class we'll learn about that. In addition, throughout the class we'll learn a different way of doing selectors because we might not want every H2 on the page to look a certain way. We might want one H2 to look a little bit different than the rest. Well, we'll learn how to do that. All right, I will post this example up to Angel. We'll see you up in lab.